Hi, this is Salim Bharti and welcome to another episode of our new show called Security. And today we have with us Archis Gore, CTO of Polyverse. Archis, first of all, good to have you again on the show. Uh, this week, uh, we found about a new vulnerability in Linux, boot hole. Number, first of all, tell me, what is boot hole? So in the simplest terms, boot hole is a, is a buffer overflow inside Grub. And so what you can do is using a config file, you can you can um, go beyond the bounds of a certain structure that it that it loads the config into, and then you can influence the values in different structures. And um, what that allows you to do is you can you can replace the bootloader with your very custom bootloader, which bypasses um, uh, the the signature checks. So what kind of uh, either operating system or what kind of machines are affected by systems are affected by it? Primarily systems that are booted with um, with Grub uh, Grub two and uh, UEFI, um, and it it depends really, right? Um, but for for the most part, Linux systems, and I hear uh, some Windows systems. Grub is you know the de facto that is there. So does that mean that every single Linux machine is kind of affected by it? Yes, uh, for now. Um, I. I think that there is a config, um, you know, it is a config, um, it has to be configured in a very specific way for uh, it to be vulnerable. And so, you know, so there are some conditions uh, under which the systems are vulnerable, right? So it's not de facto, you do have to have admin access on the machine. You have to be able to modify the bootloader config file. Uh, but in shared tenancy, it's very common for you to have uh, sudo access. Can you explain how does it really work? So based on based on what I understand, um, what happens is, um, I mean, this is this is how a classic buffer overflow works, right? So you have the let's think of like there's structure A and structure B, right? You're allowed to affect structure A, and you can do it through a config file, through some input, something coming from outside the system. And we say you can you can go modify this A thing, right? And then there is this B thing that is mine. You can't touch it, and I'm going to make sure you never get to touch it. If you prevent structure A from enforcing, if there is a bug that prevents you from enforcing the bounds checking, which says where does structure A begin and where does structure A end? If you if you screw up that bounds checking, what can happen is someone else can say, okay, I'm going to go modify structure A, which I'm allowed to do. And so they do, right? And then what they do is they, they because you aren't holding the bounds accountable, they go and give a larger input into structure A, which then overflows past the boundary of structure A and goes into structure B. And structure B is your structure, so you trust it. You never check it. You don't look for it, uh, you know, look at it for integrity checking or, or any kind of malicious action. And now, by using structure A, I have influenced structure B in a way that you have no idea that I've influenced it. And now I can make you do whatever I want, um, you know, within the confines of how you interpret structure B. And that's that's the, the most intuitive way of understanding how this works. There is this vulnerability, it affects all in a system, but in real world, what are the real danger how how vulnerable a real system actually is? Yes, um, so I'm going to actually do a statistics 101 primer real quick, right? Which is um, when you hear a surgery is 90% successful, it might mean that 90% people walk away with 100% uh, functionality back uh, and 10% people just die. Or it means that 100% of people walk away with 90% functionality back, right? And why this is important is... Um, in security, we have a very hard time understanding the impact of bugs because we sometimes look at it broadly of how much it affects. Uh, sometimes we look at it at what the impact is. In this case, what happens is um, not a lot of systems may be affected, right? Um, you know, maybe maybe practically vulnerable. But if you think about the most core systems, right? They they tend to be hand created. Uh, if you think of legacy servers. Uh, they're not virtualized. They're not containerized. They're not, uh, you know, they're not constantly being cycled, right? And so, pretty much what what it comes down to is the most vulnerable systems um, will have a hundred percent impact, right? Because the vulnerability will allow 
a complete takeover from, from pretty much the bootloader, right? The very thing that is supposed to enforce integrity checking is itself uh, losing integrity. And so, so my point there being, uh, it's not the width of the issue, but it's, it's, the, it's the depth of the issue. But furthermore, the, the type of system it's most likely to affect is a system that's a, a very manually managed database server or a very manually managed mission critical uh, ERP system. The patch is already out, uh, but we have also seen that in some cases, patches broke system also. In Red Hat case, systems were not booting up themselves. Uh, what's going on there? So this is, um, I mean, sad to say, but this is actually pretty common. Um, and it's not Red Hat's fault, right? It's it's nobody's fault really, right? This is, this is such a critical thing. Um, it's sort of like having to patch the space shuttle when it loses one tile in space, right? It's one tile and it's 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 a cheap tile, but you know, getting it in damn space it's is like a goddamn hard thing. Um, it's the same thing with bootloaders, right? It is such a crucial uh, part that that is difficult to test, difficult to sort of verify across a wide variety of devices. Uh, when you do a patch, it may not be intuitive why it might break something. Um, and that actually is the the patch risk, as we you know call it, is is really just that thing. Um, you know, this happened even when meltdown patches came out. Uh, happened when Spectre patches came out. Uh, the very first patches that came out January fifteenth ish two thousand eight, um, they just prevented machines from rebooting, and we had to wait a while. Despite the patches, it does create a lot of headache for the security teams in your company. How to kind of reduce that headache so that even if even if there are things like that, they should not lose their sleep at night. Right. So so one, you know, remember that structure A right, overriding to structure B analogy. Um, imagine if structure B was written at a different offset from structure A. Imagine if structure B came before structure A. Imagine if structure B's internal uh, members, struct fields, were reordered. Right. Any of those things mean that a, a common attack config string um, just has to be reproduced based on what where struct B is. Right. Um, it's so simple. It's so intuitive. Um, and that's exactly what we at Polyverse do. Right. Uh, by what we do is we provide every machine with those reorderings in a randomized fashion. Um, it's not fancy. It's not complicated. It's not very difficult to understand. But what it does do is if I produced a, re a repro on my machine as an attacker and I have to go attack every machine, I have to go repro that string on every single machine by completely disassembling what's going on there. Uh, and so I make the, the cost of that attack um, is ON for N machines, whereas today it's O1 where I do it once and then, and then I break across all of them. And so a very simple concept um, now, does this prevent a dedicated attacker? Not really, right? But what it does do is, is it buys you time. And so, as, as we said, you know, all these patches are being released immediately, but we can give them a little bit more time um, to, you know, to, to patch maybe just a week later with just a little bit more testing. When you look at it as a kernel or there are a lot of open source projects, uh, where you know anybody can audit the code because sometimes we still find a lot of vulnerabilities that are there which have been sitting there for uh, for a while. If you go to Polyverse, you know you also monitor you know all those known vulnerabilities that are there. Uh, the fact is that no matter what, as long as there is software, there will be these bugs which will become vulnerabilities at that point, right? So, so from your perspective, because you guys have been building all these technologies, what is the kind of uh, find a common path, middle path, to to give room for those bugs to be there, vulnerabilities to be there, without actually risking your system? Because just think of car, right? We don't assume that, hey, this is a car, brakes, brakes may fail, you know, airbags. No, that doesn't happen, you know. Your, your, your airplane will not just fall from the sky. We don't assume those things to be the norm. 
why should these things be a norm in the software industry where on a weekly basis we hear about some vulnerability compromised millions of uh, you know com accounts got compromised or servers went down why why we, why is there any middle path where while we keep the room for some vulnerabilities but we also make sure that that does not actually affect the system Yes, uh, I actually love your example of a plane um, because so I'm I'm a big scuba diver and you know everything that we design um, we you know the fail safe is called fail open, which means if a valve fails in any scuba equipment it fails into the open state, which means you're always getting gas. You might be getting too much gas, but you're never not getting gas to breathe. Right? When a plane loses engines, it it can glide for for actually an insane amount of. Um, uh, it, it was very counterintuitive me, uh, to me when I first understood this. Um, I think I think it has to do with a couple of psychological things, which I think interact. Right? Um, when we when we design security systems, we design them such that they will never fail. Right? And it is it is almost sacrilege to suggest that uh, the engines on on my security system might fail, or the valves in my scuba security system might fail. Right? And so, and so to suggest what happens next uh, is almost a non-discussable uh, topic in many security rooms, even in many development environments. What that does is we, we then don't plan for that failure in a fail-safe manner. Um, and that's why I think we end up in this. And we need to take away um, this idea, uh, you know, airplane designers are not stupid, right? Uh, NASA engineers are not stupid and things happen. And it's it's just a very and it may not it's not agency, right? We didn't make them happen. Things just happen. I mean, there might be a damn bird flying out, and that bird might enter an engine, and it, it is no fault of the designer, right? They they didn't put that bird in the engine, and so we we need to take away this this idea that when security fails, it is our agency, and thus it can never fail, right? It can fail through no fault of our own, and that's okay, and we just need to plan for it. Archie's once again, I really appreciate the time you took to, to explain Boothole, and I look forward to talk to you again soon. Thank you. Same here. Thank you for having me.